Our next speaker is Miss Phoebe Gore. Uh, Phoebe is a student at the Institute of World Politics. She is pursuing her MA in Statecraft and International Affairs. She is formerly a part of the directing team that led the inaugural Global Wellness Day Kenya 2019 celebrations. She will be speaking on New Age Public Diplomacy. So Phoebe, with that, I'll turn it over for you and your presentation. Thank you, Nathan. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Phoebe, as Nathan said. I will be talking about New Age Public Diplomacy. So um, I will start by defining diplomacy, which is the art of making a deal, or can also be described as the art of compromise. Or if you want to quote Professor Hughes, you would say the art of having the other guy have your way. Um, so let's take, for example, a, fa a family, family A. They take their child for a group date or a, play, a group play date hosted by family B. The children are getting along great. They're playing tons of games together. They're really having the time of their lives. The parents are sitting together having a good conversation while, the, while child B <clears throat> goes in the middle of the game and says, hey, um, you should spend the night. We're having such a great time to spend the night and we can play more games and possibly build a fort. So child A then thinks for a second and looks at child B and goes back and says, hey, you know what? You should ask my mother because she probably wouldn't say no to you, right? So child B goes to the, um, to the family A, the parents, and asks politely, of course, if their child to spend the night. So the parents agree and child A spends the night. They play, they build amazing forts, and both families A and B, they build a closer relationship because now it has been um, put forward by their children. And hopefully they'll be going skiing in the winter time. So <laughs> if we um, kind of dissect the story. Um, family A and B would represent the states in the international world order. Child A and B would then represent civic societies in both states. The games that they were playing would represent social and cultural norms that are both shared and learned within or exchanged between both states. The playtime or the play date, if you want to put it that way, would represent the correspondence between both civic states, and during this time, both states learn the rules of engagement, Engagement, sorry, they figure out each other's weaknesses and strengths, and they find a way to enjoy their newfound relationship to the point that they don't want to be interrupted, that's why they decide to spend the night. Um, the impromptu sleepover would then go ahead to showcase how globalization and how quickly information travels and works within the new world stage. Um, so this is where now we see public diplomacy working. Child A employed public diplomacy through using child B as a buffer in his now fortnight building for sleepover negotiation. And child B also used the tools of public diplomacy by um, going and talking to the parent, properly timing his respect, speaking politely, using a respectful tone with while making the request for um, his friend to stay who to spend the night. Child B is probably a great kid with great vocabulary, smart child. He ended up getting what he wanted, which was his friend to spend the night. So the end goal, having the Fortnite sleepover, it goes great. The kids become closer while the families also become closer and would be considered allies. So from this introduction, introductory analogy, Public diplomacy can therefore be described as using all the diplomatic instruments, cultural, educational, political, ideological, information, and intelligence designed to have relations and influence over foreign societies and their leaders. One of these instruments would is um, that I mentioned is cultural. So this would now be where cultural diplomacy comes in. Cultural diplomacy is the entire use of all the elements of culture, and in my presentation, I will be talking about sports, more specifically the athletes and the entertainment and media, um, the entertainment and media to influence foreign public opinion makers for, and foreign leaders, therefore making this the most visible and potentially influential, thus significant aspect of public diplomacy. Now back to my nice family A and B story. So family A would therefore represent numerous countries 
in the developing world that are making a pathway to increase both their political and economic freedom while looking to the U.S. And family B, well, that's the U.S., right? So child A would be <clears throat> the countries and child B would be the tools that the U.S. would use. As I mentioned before, I'm, I'll be more personable, so I'll talk about more people instead of more um, bureaucracies or um, organizations. So an example would be um, former Ambassador Matthew Bevan, who was the U.S. Ambassador to the United Kingdom. He could be a representation of a tool of public diplomacy. And he, he is quite, I quote him in this, and he says, if you listen, people hear you differently, which I think goes very, it goes a very long way to explain how impactful public diplomacy could be in this new age. Um, another tool that has enabled the growth of new age public diplomacy is globalization. So globalization can be um, described as the interaction and integration among people, cultures, companies, and governments. The process by which these said groups develop international influence and or operate on an international scale. So through globalization in the new world and in this new age that we live in, um, communication has time has been shortened. As I mentioned in the story, it literally goes from child A running to the corner to tell the parents, this is what I need, and the message has been passed across, and then actions can follow from there. So through globalization, um, there has been the phenomenon of reshaping the medium of intercultural as well as international communication. So this has happened through the increase in which I mentioned, the increase in the speed at which both states, both states and non-state actors communicate. This combined with the rise of the continuous development in communicate, telecommunication, high-speed internet, accessibility of various cell phones and operating systems across the globe, and everyone pretty much walks with a computer in their hands. Knowing that the United States has always been first in adopting any form of um, technological advancements and using technology to further grow its influence across the globe, while simultaneously directing and indirectly um, di dictating the pace to which the rest of the world moves within the international system. Most notably so, while looking at new age public diplomacy, there's a clear rise in the use of social media platforms such as Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, by diplomats, government officials, statesmen, statesmen, and other influential persons in the U.S. has seen has been on the rise for a while now. Whereas if you go on Twitter, even right now as we speak, there's probably somebody tweeting about this. And this is moving so fast that it's enabling people to continuously consume information, therefore bringing them closer to understanding what actually goes on in the United States. The closed curtain meetings are now announced, right? They, they'll be a forum or... Um, a G8 summit or whatever summit that's happening, it's going to be posted possibly on the website and shared on these various sites. By that, it's then shared, retweeted, and kept up with just by regular James and Joes like me and you on their phone, continuously finding out information about what's going on by the touch of the screen or by, uh, by buttons or by the touch of the screen, depending what, on what device you're using, sorry. So after the forums and summits and meet, meetings, the resolutions from these meetings, again, are put um, out there in the feed, right? So then after the meetings, we have leaders tweeting out the resolutions or what new pacts have come out or how they feel about the meeting that just happened. So this now brings the information to us. So we're regular days and Joe's like you and I, educators and lists. Um, activists, opinion pieces, talk show hosts, um, such as, you know, from Stephen Colbert to Hassan Minhaj or Trevor Noah, depending on what kind of show you like, um, they bring them to the forefront of the public in a matter of seconds, whereas you would have to possibly wait for your professor to go and analyze what happens, and then you can figure out what happens, and you can analyze according to a guided way. You now have the freedom of literally interpreting it in however and whatever format that you want for your own self. Then with this now rises the, the civic activity between any society will automatically increase because you have the information, the information is right in front of you. 
And this, with the civic activity on the rise, responsibility and duty all across the world goes up. And the championing for due process, democracy, human and civil rights all follow the model put forward by the United States and its civic society. Globalization has also blurred the boundaries between foreign and domestic affairs. I say this using the most recent example, which would be the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, when the pandemic hit, everybody looked to the United States to know what can we do if it gets to the point of where it's gotten here. And regardless of whether you know some states were more efficient at managing it or not, the baseline of it was we need to know where the U.S. is so that we can know in which mode to operate. This was by the fact, the fact checking, the numbers of um, cases on the rise or on the low, and this was a daily, day to day thing. Every single news outlet that you can now access from Mumbai to Georgetown to Foggy Bottom to wherever you are in the world, you can access it by the click of a button. This made it that when the president would have a statement or release, have a press release, anybody can access that because of the internet, right? So the boundaries between foreign and domestic affairs have now been crossed because foreign nationals now, not only are they looking to their governments as to what they should do, but they're holding their governments to other, to the U.S. standard of, if they're here, then you claim to be, you know, you're all sovereign, so you should have almost similar, the same responses to certain things. Um, this has also been, this boundary again has also been blurred by the clear um, diversity present in the United States. And this is very apparent when you look at the diaspora population in this country. From the African diaspora to the Caribbean community, um, there's a huge back and forth and relaying of information and policies and how, on, or a simple way of life in the United States that is projected onto the world through the, the citizens that are present in this country. Therefore, um, U.S. ideals and policies and, and cultural norms are not so far-fetched. When we talk about um, going and sharing our culture and trying to indulge ourselves in other people's cultures, it's so easily done because possibly the country that you're looking at, if it's India, if it's um, Ethiopia, if it's Ghana, if it's Nigeria, there is there are those nationals in this country, therefore, they can easily see themselves as Americans because they have seen Nigerian Americans, Ghanaian Americans, Ethiopian Americans. So this makes them more susceptible and more amiable by in the U by U.S. values. That's making them, um, I would say, more accepting of U.S. policies and the U.S. policies that are coming in. Um, another um, another impact of globalization through with regard to the new age public diplomacy would be empowered new actors. And this is where I bring in the sports and the athletes and the entertainment industry, which is all the fun stuff. <laughs> um, so uh, again, through the same, you know, the high speed internet, everything now is by a touch of a button. People in my home country, which is Kenya, um, look to what people in the United States are doing in case of certain things. As I mentioned, the COVID um, pandemic, when people started making homemade masks, right? Everybody was now, everybody now, I mean, I think I can make a homemade mask too, but it came from the fact that we were like, okay, if people, we can make this at home. We don't have to wait on Amazon because we don't have Amazon yet on the continent or you don't have Amazon in the Caribbean countries, right? So you, you look at um, people from, Foreign citizens, sorry, foreign citizens look into the United States through particular individuals that they can address and they can relate themselves to. Whether it's your favorite athlete, whether it's your favorite actress, whether it's your favorite film producer, whether it's your favorite um, series that's going on right now. If the person involved in these um, media outlets and entertainment and movies and music and all that, if they're all involved in whatever is happening now and they all say, hey, wash your hands and hey, wear a mask and stay six feet apart, then the person following them from across the, the world can easily apply what they're saying because it's coming from somebody that they deem as an idol. And I think this is what has influenced and continues to influence um, a more 
acceptable American culture everywhere else in the world because our generation looks up to the people that we can easily tweet and ask them when we're talking and we might, there's a slim chance that they'll respond to us, but the fact that people from across the globe have access to that person who has power, who has influence, who knows what he's doing, who knows how to, or who has put America in such a light that they're living this way because they're in this country and this is happening for their own purpose makes it better for better for the United States to kind of put their ideals into these other countries and build on their relationship with these countries from a civic level, which would now make it easier for the for the government in these countries to kind of listen to their civic society and take on what America has to say to them. Um, I want to also talk about the film industry, which I think um, a lot of people who do public diplomacy, at least in my research, haven't really expanded on it and how impactful it could be. Um, we're seeing we're seeing um, the global village, as I call it, happen in the sense that we share a lot of human experiences. And now that we live in this global village, we the human aspects of everything that's going on, be it terrorism, be it the BRI initiative, be it um, communism, be it authoritarianism, be it um, systems of government that don't necessarily work for the people, we're seeing all our problems and plight be taken on by other people, more specifically in the United States, because of the numbers that we have here and as much as as much use as people use the internet here. So whatever tiny problem was happening in Zimbabwe or whatever problem is happening in Nigeria or in the Congo, it's easier for people here to get the message across and create more awareness about um, a perceived issue like what um, what is happening in Sudan with President Bashir and you know the, the strong the strong lady who was on top of the car and she was chanting and this image went viral and everybody knew about it and it made people now learn about what's going on in Sudan just because they've there's a dedicated group of people who are vividly um, sharing news about everybody else. Now, if I take that into how the U.S. can tap into that, is that is the positive light. It shows that no matter, it shows the humanistic aspects of the United States instead of looking looking to the U.S. like you know Mother May I or you know the boots on the ground or this super hard powerful country. You're looking at the U.S. in retrospect of their civic society. So whatever respect that you give to the country, you give it to the person who felt bad for you when you were having your problem in your country. And this is the the major part of 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 sorry of public diplomacy that I think is being tapped into and has the potential to really shape the perception of the United States in the developing world as everybody else is catching up. So whereas in the past we would have to it and kind of be dictated towards what's going on, whoever is in whatever part of the, or, or wherever continent can just get on their phone and find out what's, what's supposed to happen. And if they want to champion for democracy, if they have a problem with what's going on with the civil rights of their country, if they have a problem with the authoritarianism in their said country, they could easily look into the United States and figure out how to manage that. And as well as immerse public sympathy from the United States, which always goes a long way in creating the awareness that needs, especially in times of regime change and what needs to be done and said. Um, so in conclusion, um, endorsed by the US, I think that a lot of um, influential persons and a lot of celebrities, quote unquote, for people who don't like using that word, I'll just use influential persons, a lot of athletes um, have, a, have a, a strong foothold on the rest of the international community that I think the United States has already noticed and they use it for their advantage. But I think there's a broader sense of untapped, extremely untapped um, resource. It's an extremely untapped resource by the United States government. Well, thank you, Phoebe. I I truly couldn't agree more with that. Someone who is getting, is has their emphasis in public diplomacy, uh, Phoebe and I, share a lot of our own interests, especially with sports diplomacy. 
Uh, I will reserve my right as the moderator to ask the first question, though, uh, something that I want to ask based on something you said. Uh, You talk a lot about how people from all over the globe uh, Mm -hmm. can just pick up their phone um, as long as they have an internet connection and they can get news from anywhere across the globe. Uh, And particularly, you talk about seeing kind of those influential persons within the U.S., uh, how people from all over the world can look at those influential persons and gain some of that uh, information from them. I mean, when I spent some time in Africa, I got asked if I knew LeBron James all the time. Yeah. No. <laughs> but with that uh, information sharing in a global market uh, is very reliant on the internet. Uh, but there have been many cases of more authoritarian regimes uh, limiting internet access for their populations, normally closer to election times or, or in times of crises. Uh, what are the impacts of that uh, on this ability to have this kind of public diplomacy that doesn't exist in a face-to-face market, but really exists via an internet connection uh, when you have leaders who are limiting the ability of their citizens to access that information? Right. Um, So unfortunately, that's the dark side about it, right? Where if you don't have... If you if you're in an in in an authoritarian regime, you don't have that much access. So the kind of in between ground would be this is going to sound really weird, but it would be the same um, influence made by one person, like you know your LeBron James um, analogy. The same influence made by one person, the underlying factor for that would be the hope aspects now this is really going to be kumbaya but the hope at the hope the hope aspects of it is what um comes off as a as kind of like a band-aid to the problem so the citizens in this um in this regime kind of would would find a way to either, I'm assuming, this is on the continent, I'm assuming they would find a way to either move towards other countries that have um, better, you know, better laws and get their message out there to and, and to tell people what's going on. And that's the other beauty about it. The moment one person hears about it, there's a chance that it's going to get out there and everybody's now going to know what's going on. The sad part about it is we can't act on it as fast as we'd like to because of international law and, and the sovereignty law, but their kind of unspeakable truth will not be hidden from the people of the whole world. Of course. Uh, we have time for one more quick question, just about another minute or two before we move on to our last speaker. Uh, sure. What is the impact of sports figures in particular in the United States on influencing domestic politics, particularly in the light of the Black Lives Matter movement? So um, I think the impact is bigger than we think, especially with the recurring problems that we're, we're facing right now. So whereas we have more athletes who are coming out to say, um, pay attention to the law, know more about your rights and pay attention to the civic way of doing things so that you're not also found in trouble, quote unquote, you know, for you to have good trouble, to be in good trouble continuously. So I think athletes speaking out speaks more to the younger generation and it speaks more in the sense of they see themselves in these athletes because naturally um, we look up to people who have cool shoes and we look up to people who have better cars and this, that, and the third, and they've achieved that status. So hearing from them is not hard and driving your message through them makes it easier for people to take it in because you feel like this is somebody that you know and you get to also follow their lives online at the same time. So and it's a, I think it's an astounding thing that what like the NBA bubble is doing and everything where you're reminding people every single day of what's going on. So you're completely immersing the culture in everything that Black Lives, Black Lives continue to matter and still matter and will matter, always matter, right? That that will continuously happen. So you're not forgetting. It's not a fad because 
you know that your favorite athlete also knows that this is going on. It's not just to you. So you don't feel alone in this, you know, that struggle that's going on right now. Of course. Well, mm-hmm. I appreciate that, both answering your both questions that we had, as well as your presentation. Uh, thank you again, Phoebe. Mm-hmm.